Hey everybody, my name is Christian Hyatt. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Risk360 and welcome to this webinar. Um, today I'm going to talk about a thinking exercise that I've created related to the five CISO archetypes. And there's really a few goals of this webinar um, and, and I want everyone in the security space to be able to use this as a tool really to accomplish three things. Um, one, to do a self-assessment and understand what kind of security leader you might be and how that could impact your career and impact the teams that you build and the organizations that you serve. So we'll talk through the five CISO archetypes and get to some of that. The, the second piece of this is really to understand the business objectives that drive business decisions that impact security programs. And I'm gonna present three of those and then hopefully give you the tools to get inside the mind of executives at your organization and understand the why behind why they might wanna build security programs. And then we'll talk about some case studies and some thinking exercises so you can assess your own organization and hopefully we'll apply some of these principles to, to build out your security program. And then hopefully, if you understand yourself and what kind of executive or security practitioner that you want to be or that you are, and you understand the business objectives of your organization, you can harmonize those two things and, and be the type of leader you need to be to support your business. Or if you're a business, start building a security program that's in alignment with your business objectives. So those are some of the outcomes of, of this webinar that we're hoping to get. A little bit of background on how we formed this information. So uh, Risk360, the company that I'm a CEO of, um, over the last five or six years, we've done over a thousand security assessments. So doing those security assessments and those audits, uh, we've realized that there's certain patterns or trends or things that are consistent across these organizations. And over the years, we've, we've picked up those patterns and a lot of what we've found is the result of this presentation. So a lot of just anecdotal information and data gathering that allowed us to pick up these trends. The second piece of this is uh, I do a, a weekly podcast called Tuesday Morning Grind where I talk to security executives. Uh, as of this recording, we're a little over 60 episodes in, so that's about 60 executives that I've been able to have hour to two hour long conversations with about information security topics. And between talking to those executives and those thousand security assessments, you know, that's where these patterns really started to emerge. So we realized that there's really five types of security leaders, and I'll, I'll talk about those in this presentation. There's three sec uh, business objectives that align to uh, security programs, and, and if you can align those two, ultimately something really special happens. <clears throat> so let's talk about really the meat of this webinar, which is uh, what are the five CISO archetypes and It'll be interesting to see if maybe those reflect who you are or if you have someone in your network that meets one of these type of uh, security leader types. Before I hop in um, and you think through and you start self-assessing what kind of security archetype you might be, um, just know that these are all equal. There's no one archetype that is better than another. You shouldn't aspire to be one versus the other. Um, they're really all equal and their strengths and weaknesses will vary based on the types of organizations they uh, serve given situations. So don't feel the need to align to one or the other. Most people share many of these characteristics and really just understand what your natural strengths are and how you might be able to support an organization. Um, the first CISO archetype that I've identified is, is the executive. So the executive is uh, someone who is really good with cross-functional leadership. They are good at managing teams. They're probably good at things like budgeting, um, change initiatives, a lot of executive presence. A lot of the executives in security leadership positions that I've seen were, were former CIOs or COOs or CTOs that moved into a security position. Um, but the downside of a, an executive archetype is they might be someone who lacks technical skills or doesn't have the desire to get into the weeds. So they probably weren't an engineer typically by trade. Um, they might not even like compliance frameworks or really getting into the weeds on those things. They're more of the visionary type of person, but nonetheless a great leader, great at understanding business objectives and uh, speaking to peer executives in an organization. 
So the type of support an executive also often needs is some a team that can fill those gaps. So maybe they're looking for network engineers, maybe they're looking for security operations center engineers, or a product team lead, uh, compliance uh, leaders. They, they really need a team around them to do the blocking and tackling technical tasks. Um, so that gets into the fit. An executive typically isn't the best fit uh, for a player coach type of position. So if you're a startup or something and you're looking for an individual who's going to come in and put together a strategy and also do all the work, an executive probably is going to get burned out. They're not going to get a lot of energy out of that. Uh, so they're not a good fit. But if you have a, a large organization that can resource under the executive and you're looking for someone who can set a vision and a strategy, communicate to the board, to peer executives, and build a team under them, they might be the perfect kind of person that you want at the table. I know for me, I, I've seen historically the executive archetype at larger organizations, um, and I think that is because um, they're great visionaries. Larger organizations have the complexity and the resources to build teams under that executive, um, so that works out. In, in startups, I haven't historically seen someone who meets the classic executive archetype in a security role. So you can probably think of your own teams and organizations or the types of organizations that you serve if you're a consultant and, and know who the executive is and who is not. If, if you're thinking for yourself that you feel like you're an executive, this could go into the type of organization that you might want to work for. Maybe you don't want to go work for that startup. Maybe you're better fit for a Fortune 500 company because you have those attributes that uh, would energize you most for that type of organization. If you are an organization looking for a security hire, Think about what you really need. Do you need an executive? Uh, maybe you'd be better fit for one of these other archetypes. The second type of archetype that I've identified is what I call the engineer. The engineer in many ways is uh, the opposite of the executive in that the engineer probably has a technical background, maybe in product, maybe, maybe in network security or something like that, but they're naturally technically oriented, and they probably, uh, as a result, uh, do really good earning the, I guess, the credibility from their team. Um, if they have a technical team, there's someone who can get in the weeds with their team, probably enjoys and is energized by getting in the weeds with their team and doing technical things. Um, the engineer is uh, does really well in organizations that um, are maybe product-led. So if you're a company and product security is the most important thing for you when you think about security, you might benefit from a security leader who has that product or, or engineering, software engineering background. Um, they also do pretty well in organizations where maybe standing up a security operations center and network monitoring and intrusion is a top concern because they can get in the weeds and really think about how that needs to be architect. Um, they're, they're going to do a really good job managing teams of subject matter experts because they have empathy there. So if your team's uh, all pen testers or you have a team of uh, product engineers and product security people, might be a, a, a great fit. But traditionally hate bureaucracy um, and compliance. So um, you know if you have to go get SOC 2 reports or ISO certifications, you're heavily regulated and HIPAA is your biggest concern, and you got to interpret frameworks and go through audits, the engineer is probably going to be demotivated by that, not going to find a lot of energy from there. So they could still be successful at your organization, but you might need to build a team around them that's good at that type of stuff. So team assembly will be really important. Um, I do think from a best fit, um, engineers do well at startups. A lot of security practitioners that I see at startups will, will have the engineering archetype uh, because the startup itself is product focused, but even at larger organizations, um, if you have a, a, a SaaS, B2B SaaS platform um, that you can't risk a data breach and you need to think about roles and product design, the engineer archetype might fit really well there. Or like I said earlier, if you have a huge organization and network security is uh, most important, you have to build out a security operations center, they might fit in really well there. Um, if you're reporting to the board of directors and it's like a very public, visible type of CISO and they have to think about budgets and cross-functional leadership, um, sometimes that might not be energizing to the engineer. So you'd have to think about maybe an executive would be the better fit there. Again, there's overlapping skill sets, so don't pigeonhole the engineer into one thing. They might be a great executive also, but in general, this is a personality type. 
Um, the next one is the GRC guru. So this is a person who really thrives um, in the compliance and the certification and uh, policy regulatory world. So if you are an organization that you know has to get every certification under the belt, you have to get SOC 2, ISO, GDPR is a, a big thing for you and it's burdening the organization, this is the type of person that can come in and implement a strategy to navigate all that regulatory and compliance stuff. Um, like the executive, the GRC guru is often good at um, governance. So maybe they're good with cross-functional leadership. They understand how uh, security is not siloed to security, but it takes a village across organizations to manage that. So that they'll be good in areas like that. Um, also, based on the GRC guru's background, they're typically really good with risk. So uh, they're, I, they're good at identifying business risk and then allowing security activities to you know, reduce that risk, which is great for most organizations. Like I said, master at compliance, um, but like the executive, probably lacks a, a deeply technical background. So if you need them to do tool selection or be hands-on, they're not going to be configuring firewalls. If you need them to be a uh, product security is a big thing for you. The GRC guru is probably not going to be intimately familiar with the, the engineering aspects of product. So you'll want to build a team around them to, to fill those gaps. That's kind of the theme here. Um, understand your strengths if you are the GRC guru and build a team around yourself to support you where you have gaps. Yeah, two more here. Um, so the next is the builder. Uh, I kind of think I'm a builder. I think a lot of consultants are builders. Um, this is a person who is really good at coming in and taking programs to the next level, either building a program absolutely from scratch, executing against a playbook, or uh, taking it from a low maturity to a high maturity in rapid succession. I've seen a lot of virtual CISOs and consultants that fit the builder archetype. I've also seen folks who are just really good at, uh, like for example, startups coming in and achieving certification quickly. Uh, building momentum. They're great in environments that have a ton of change. So if you're a high growth tech company or you're a company that does a lot of mergers and acquisitions, building tons of products, you need someone who's just very comfortable with change. This would be the builder archetype. They'd be a perfect for that role. The downside of the builder archetype is that they're, they're not well energized by maintenance of a program. So if you have a program that's up and running and you just really need someone to maintain that program over the long haul, or you have initiatives that take two or three years to mature, um, it's no rapid change, it's just incremental slow change, that's probably not going to um, energize the builder. And you'll see with builders, if they're in a, an environment that they get bored with, they're kind of job hoppers. So maybe you'll see someone like every two years they have a new job. Uh, maybe they've taken temporary consultant gigs. So if you are a builder, you know, look for that really diverse, dynamic environment that you can thrive in. And if you're an organization hiring, you know, you, and you have a lot of rapid change, M&A, startup environment, you want that builder. But if you're the big company that needs someone who's going to be able to see through a mission for four or five years, a builder might not make sense for you. Um, the last uh, archetype that I have seen is what I'll call the technician and the technician, um, I'll preface by saying, I don't think that this is a true CISO position. The technician is typically an IT person or a CTO or a director of IT who has taken over security as an additional duty. So think of the classic, uh, you know, director of IT, the IT department who manages the help desk, deploys laptops, manages the ne uh, company network. You know, it is the IT professional but knows security is vitally important, so has accepted those responsibilities because the company needs it. Um, I say that this isn't a CISO role or a security role because historically um, there's not enough independence for the person doing the work to also um, oversee the work. And what I mean by that is if you're the IT person and you're implementing all the firewalls, well, you very well can't audit your own work to see if you've implemented them correctly and to secure standards. So at large organizations, or, or really any organization, if you can and you have the resources, you want to separate the security role, who plays an oversight role to IT. Um, that way there's independence and you can peer review each other's work. 
However, the bottom line is lots, a lot of organizations do not have the risk or do not have the resources to have a full-time security professional or security leader. So that ends up by, being by de, fact, uh, de facto is the IT professional or IT leader becomes the security leader. And maybe you hire a junior security analyst or something like that to manage the program. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the reality of the environment. Um, but this, from my experience as a consultant, is a very popular type of person that I'm dealing with where they've just inherited security because they're passionate about it or because they know it needs to get done. So if you are an IT professional but you kind of uh, do some security work, this might be you. Or if you're an organization short on resources, uh, you might have to ask your IT professional to take on some security roles. But just know this isn't a pure security role. It's just a common type of individual that takes on information security responsibilities. So th those are the five uh, CISO archetypes. Um, if you're a consultant, I'm sure you've seen these type of people out in the field. If you are a security professional, I bet one of these or a couple of these really resonates with you. If you're unsure, um, we've created this tool. It's a quiz that you can take that will help you determine your five, uh, which archetype you most align to. And, and maybe you'll find that you align to a couple of them pretty well. You can use the QR code here or this link in the slide and I'll also link to this in the description if you're watching this on YouTube or, or wherever so you can uh, access this. Um, we, I, I do gather some demographic information uh, as you're taking this. You don't have to provide your email or anything like that, although we would, we would love it if you would and we'll send you out a newsletter. But the reason I collect the demographic information is because I'm, I'm going to share this out. So if you share your email, I'll try to share it with you as well. Um, the results of these CISO archetypes. So we'll ask questions like, what's your current level? And then what type of organization do you work with? Because I think an interesting result in the future will be correlating organization types to CISO archetypes. So maybe we find that you know the Fortune 500 company tends to attract a certain type of security leader, or the startup tends to attract a certain kind of security leader, same with which industry you're in. So this is information I'll share later uh, with everyone as we kind of uh, gather enough uh, quiz results to do that right now. I think we have about 100 uh, participants and we're seeing some trends emerge. So really appreciate if you take this quiz. I think it'll be insightful for yourself to kind of know who you are, but also great from a, a, a research perspective that we'll make sure that we share out. Um, so in the next section, we've already talked about like what kind of archetype you might be. Um, and, and maybe you know yourself a little bit better or, and you're starting to think through how you need to build the team. But the second piece of this is you really need to understand what the business objectives for your organization uh, are. And the good news is, is um, I think that there are only three business objectives that companies have that impact the direction of security. There's only three. And virtually everything that you do in security will align to that. So we'll talk about each of those business objectives. We'll go over some case studies, um, and I'll try to give you some specific examples of how I've seen this play out in business. And maybe you can apply this to your organization or an organization that you might work for in the future and uh, really make you a great security executive because you'll understand the executives why, what their intent is, why they're making certain actions, and how you can A, speak their language, and B, really prioritize your security objectives in a way that supports the business objective directly. Um, so at a high level, there's only, like I said, there's only three. Uh, one reason companies do this, uh, one of their business objectives is to reduce risk, risk management. Um, the second one is they want to reduce complexity or reduce cost. That's another reason you might take on a security initiative. And the third uh, reason is revenue generation, meaning what you do in information security is directly correlated to the organization's ability to generate revenue and perform sales. So as you're reading through these, some of these might be extremely intuitive. Some you, you might not understand the bridge. How exactly does security impact that particular business objective? So we're going to dive into it now. So if you're a little lost, don't worry, we'll get to it and I'll talk about uh, how this relates back to security. So I want to start with risk management. Um, in my mind, risk management is the, the intuitive reason companies do information security. Um, you know, ultimately, you want to reduce risk. You want to protect your critical data or infrastructure. You want to prevent that breach. Um, 
I think that when you think of security, this is what you think you're doing, like intuitively. You know that you're reducing risk for the company, you're stopping the bad guys. Um, it's the most critical thing. You'll see organizations that really care about risk management um, prioritizing things like new tool imp implementation or uh, security operations center, breach response, incident response. Those are common things that they, they really, really care about. Um, the type of company that you will see prioritize risk management are, are companies that house a lot of critical infrastructure, critical data, and if that data was exfiltrated, it would really be company ending for them. Uh, they can't risk a breach. It would be uh, devastating. Um, I will tell you now that I do not think, this is counterintuitive, most organizations' primary reason for doing security is not risk management. And, and that can be a little bit disheartening because I think the reason that most of us are in security is this idea that we're protecting something, we're motivated by that. It's an admirable profession to protect things, keep the bad guys out. But the reality is at the business level, that's not the primary motivator for most organizations. And I'll convince you of that fact here in a second. So if you are at an organization and you're making the assumption right now that your job is risk management, that might not be what, why your executive is willing to allocate resources and spend to that objective. It's probably related to cost reduction or re, um, revenue generation. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but let's talk about a case study because I think this will help drive this home. So in this case study, uh, we've, we've come up with the idea of this organization, Critical Corp, and they have 500 million uh, records on, on people globally. Uh, they share information with federal and state government. They house things like social security numbers, uh, employee history, government clearances. You can think of the type of organization that might have this kind of data on people. Um, the reality is this company is the target of nation states, criminal organizations, um, if their data is compromised, they're basically done. So they can't risk it. Their threat environment, the assets that they have, the types of threats that they have, and, and the impact of the business are, as such, it's just unacceptable to have a security breach. So if you are this organization, you know, get inside the mind of the executive. What do they care about? So as a thinking exercise, the executives probably care about, you know, preventing a breach at all, all costs. Like it's breach prevention. It's an intuitive thing. They got to stop it. So they got to dedicate the necessary resources to implement the tools and have the people in place to do that. Um, you'll see this with a lot of government entities. You'll see this with really large corporations, healthcare organizations, things like that. And in this case, if you're this organization, you probably are right that risk management is of top concern. That's what they care about. Um, so if you think about that as a security leader, what kind of organization are you going to need to support that? What type of security archetype would best support that mission? So for a large organization like this, I know that I'm probably going to need cross-functional team members. Uh, I'm probably going to have to build out an organization, probably large budgets that I'm dealing with. And this is the classic case where maybe an executive would be a really good fit. Um, you need someone who can manage that complex organization, do risk assessments, do budgeting, communicate up to the board, communicate with peer executives. Now, I could also say if there's a, a, a huge product in place here, and product security is most important, maybe you need a product uh, or an in, the engineer as the archetype that can come in and do that. Or maybe you just need someone who shares those archetypes. So if you are that person, you might be a great fit for this type of organization. Or if you're this organization trying to build a team out, you can start seeing how the archetype or the types of people that you want to build on, how they're energized, might fit to this organization. Again, I think this is the intuitive one. So let's move on to the next two I think are less intuitive, but I hope provide an epiphany for you as you think through why your business is willing to uh, put money towards security. Cost reduction. So when I say cost reduction, this isn't just about money. It is about money, but it's also about resources and complexity. So organizations often want to reduce the complexity, the resource requirements, and the cost of security. Um, organizations that might fit this particular profile is the classic example as you can think of an organization that has just tons of compliance. Maybe they have to do ISO, SOC 2, FedRAMP, HIPAA, they're just way overburdened with compliance. And what's that, what that means for that organization is that their engineers and their team members that are supposed to be doing work day to day 
or burdened with audit evidence collection or audit walkthroughs or, or bureaucracy, all this regulation is really preventing them from doing anything. And if, you, if, their product, if their product folks can't do work, that's hindering the company's margins. So as a security leader, you might need to come in and greatly reduce that burden. So you might come in and implement a strategy where maybe you're gonna harmonize all the security frameworks and really make the audit burden much less. Maybe you're gonna figure out strategies to overlap all the frameworks. Um, you probably care about things like automation and things that will reduce human effort. You might wanna build a team of GRC gurus, that kind of thing. So that's an example of cost reduction. Uh, we'll do a case study to help you think through like the executive mindset. But in this example, um, there's a company, Megasass, who's a huge project management tool, probably the biggest uh, on the planet. And it's used by millions of end users, but the problem with the project management tool is that it has tons of different use cases. There's organizations that do it for uh, healthcare purposes, they might do it for business process optimization. It's really unlimited use cases which in turn means they have to comply with almost every certification in the book. SOC 2, ISO, High Trust, they constantly have clients asking them for this, GDPR, because they uh, also operate in Europe, and it's hurting the team. Uh, the engineering team is just burdened with audits, so they can't actually work on product work, the stuff that engineering them, uh, that energizes the engineering team. So they're, in this case, um, the engineering team is experiencing high turnover, because of all, they're tired of doing, dealing with audits and auditors. So it's having a huge negative impact on this company's ability to move quickly and build product. Um, this is actually, all these examples are based on uh, real, wor real world examples that I've seen firsthand. Um, and so if you're this company, what do you think the executive team cares about? So they probably really wanna deburden their engineers. They gotta keep them. Um, I've literally seen instances where the engineering team is so burdened with audit evidence that they leave um, or they just can't do engineering work. Um, if I'm the executive at that company, like that's unacceptable. If I'm spending you know, huge amounts of money on complex re compliance requirements, you have to reduce that burden. So you can, I think it's easy to understand from the executive's perspective how this would suddenly become top priority for them. Reduction of complexity, reducing costs and efforts associated with information security, implementing tools that can automate some of this um, would be utmost important. Um, team members that are really good with this, if you think about it from the archetype perspective, um, the GRC guru, uh, this is the classic environment that a GRC guru would thrive in. You come in with a complex regulatory and compliance environment, you simplify it, they're really good at it. I've also seen uh, even engineers be good at this because they're, they're naturally automation minded, so they might be able to develop tools. Um, so when you enter an organization, if you see this, if you see this type of environment and that's what you're walking into, uh, I think it's easy to understand how you can guess at the types of activities that the security team is probably going to ask you to prioritize. So the next one um, is revenue generation. So uh, I think this is probably the least intuitive of the business objectives um, that security people might guess why they're doing security. But from my experience, revenue generation is actually one of the deep perhaps the most common reason securities are willing to invest in information security. And the reason is, is essentially most organizations have a quest to obtain customer trust. Because if you think about it, if I'm an organization and I wanna do business with Bank of America or the federal government, well those large entities aren't gonna do business with me unless they feel like you know my security program is mature enough not to put them at risk. So they're gonna ask, for a security certification. They're gonna ask me to do things contractually uh, in my agreements with the company, et cetera. And as an executive, I'm going to know that if I wanna do business with that entity, well, guess what? I better have that security certification. I better be able to say yes on questionnaires and answer those questions. So really, security in these situations becomes a means for, the means for an organization to close sales. Uh, so you'll see a security practitioner doing things like answering security questionnaires, sitting in on sales calls, obtaining certifications, that kind of thing. So that's what revenue generation is. Uh, I'll give you a case study to drive this home. And, and this, if you're a high growth tech company, which is 
really what Risk360 works with the most. You're a classic company driven by revenue generation. So in this example, Cash, Off is a, uh, Cash Soft is a startup that recently received $35 million in venture capital funding. They have to grow. They're doubling revenue every year. They're acquiring new customers left and right. But every customer is vetting them, asking them about PCI and SOC2. Um, they also have two partners uh, that are banks that want to finalize uh, some work with them. But to close those partnerships, they have to demonstrate compliance. So this is... So put yourself in the mind of the, the CEO in, at this company. What are you going to ask your security team to do? Well, you're probably going to ask your security team to go get security certifications efficiently. You're probably going to be sitting in on sales calls to help put the customer at ease that your security environment's uh, you know, what you say it is. You're probably going to be responding to security questionnaires. You're probably going to be participating in, in contract reviews around information security. This is the classic startup environment, high growth tech type environment. A lot of startups, business to business SaaS companies, um, technology first organizations, this is exactly what they're dealing with. Um, and it is possible that you're dealing with multiple of these business objectives. For example, if you're Amazon or AWS, for example, you probably care about risk management, probably cost reduction because you have to comply with everything, and probably also revenue generation. So it might be multiple business objectives. But you can see in this example how revenue generation is, is critical. Um, because it's my area of expertise, I, I also want to throw out a thinking exercise here. Where in this example, CashSoft just got $35 million in venture capital funding. So what that means is CashSoft has a mandate to grow. So, so that venture capital company didn't give cash off $35 million for nothing. They did that because they're expecting a huge return on that investment, often a 10x return. Uh, the way VC funding works is most of the companies you fund fail. So they're looking for you know one or two opportunities that grow 10x. And the only way that cash soft can make that investment make sense is by explosive growth. They're literally spending all of that money as fast as they can in the name of growth. And they're typically you know, running at a loss to do that. So they're not focused on profits. It's just customer acquisition. So other things that this security team is probably thinking about in the high growth tech space is scalability. So if you're, you're the head of security at a high growth tech company, you need to be thinking about solutions that are going to scale because maybe you join the company when there are 100 people, but they're going to be 500 people in the next year or two. So that means, for example, if I'm choosing identity and access management tools, I better choose something that's going to fit the company at 500 people, not just at 100 people. Maybe I'm thinking about how to rapidly onboard and offboard people. Maybe I'm thinking about single sign-on solutions. I, I provide all that context to think about. You can understand how business context and growth trajectory and the markets that you serve will directly influence how you want to structure your security program, which tools you buy, how you organize the team, etc. So do not underestimate the power of understanding your company's business model, their growth projections, their competitive environment, what they plan on doing in terms of receiving venture capital funding. Those kind of dynamics will deeply impact your information security program no matter the phase of growth. And if you're at a really big company, you might even need to look at it at a business unit level because maybe you're at a huge company, but the business unit is high growth. Or maybe uh, they've made a new acquisition that meets these different requirements. Um, some organizations, depending on the business unit or the geographic location, might have very distinct requirements. So take a, a huge Fortune 500 company. They might have one product-led organization that revenue generation is the key. They might have another really high-risk federal division that risk management is the key. They might have another struggling business unit where they're really bogged down in compliance requirements, so cost reduction is the key. So this is where, you, as a security leader, you can do an assessment across the whole organization and figure out where um, these business objectives might impact your security strategy and also how you might want to build the team because you might need service line uh, or business unit leaders that are different archetypes to support you as an overarching security leader. Or if you as the security leader are going to play an individual contributor role or you're going to play a role where you're supporting a leader, you might want to assess that leader, understand what their archetype is, 
what your business objectives are and how you as an individual contributor can plug a gap for them and help support their overall objective. So that's how all of this stuff is linked. We do have a tool. So um, if you're assessing your own organization, I think one of the most important things you can do, whether you're looking for a job and you're assessing and you kind of want to do some assessments on the types of organizations that you might go work for, or if you're part of an organization today and you want to think through what is, what is in the mind and heart of your executive and what do they care about and why. We've created another quiz uh, that you can download, check out the QR code or um, go to the form here and you can uh, take this quiz and get a sense for based on uh, the questions that we ask, what are likely your company's business business objectives? And it's just a good way to sanity check what your gut's already telling you. Um, just like the other ones, we gather uh, demographic information. We don't share this with anyone. Um, you can leave the company name blank if you'd like to, although we'd love to know what it is so we can uh, do some further analysis. But this is research that we're trying to gather to understand based on organization type, industry, that kind of thing, what, uh, what is likely their business, biggest business problem that might impact information security. This is another piece of data that we'll definitely share out as an organization. So if you um, give us your data and tell us a little bit about the company you're working for, uh, we'll keep it anonymous, but we'll definitely share that data out so the whole community can benefit from it and we can do some analytics on that. So greatly appreciate it if you would do that. Um, another tool um, that we've created is that if you're an organization, you know, could you say today that you understand the whole universe of information security in terms of what should your organization look like? Who owns each task? What are all of the tasks that a mature organization would need to have? Um, who's responsible, accountable, consulted, informed? That's our classic RACI diagram. If you can't answer those things, if you can't, uh, if you don't have a model, to think through the types of people and roles and responsibilities that you need in your organization, we've created a tool just for that. Even if you're a one-man show at a startup, uh, it's likely that you're relying on other people in the organization to fill certain gaps for you, and they, they might not even know it. If you're a really large, complex organization, you might need to hire additional people to fill gaps. You might This might inform your hiring roadmap and get everybody on the same page. It's also a great tool to present to executives who are unfamiliar with security and really silo security or think it's a really technical role and to demonstrate to them that you know security is pretty broad it takes takes the whole organization to support it and this is a free download that you can uh you can download from us and i'll, I'll provide the link in the description of this video uh, also coming soon where you can get these resources you can download this i think it's a great start to start building a team around yourself it's even more effective if you pair it with the other two tools where you kind of understand your security archetype the archetype of your team members you understand your business objectives, then you can really start doing some work to build out your security organization. Um, so if you need help with any of this stuff, if, if you're a security expert and you're a one-man show or you're wearing multiple hats, this, exact, this is exactly the model that RISC 360 does in virtual CISO services. Um, I would more than welcome the opportunity to help your organization, or if we're not helping, just have a conversation with you to give you some food for thought for building your own team. That's exactly what we do. Um, if you want some of these materials, um, you can head over to our resource center. So uh, if you go to our website, we have a tab that's called resources that creates a, a drop down and you'll see an area where you can go download uh, free white papers from us. There's a learning center that provides a ton of details on all the compliance frameworks. We also have a video center. Um, and a podcast that we do weekly with security executives. Just a ton of resources to help you along the way of your security journey. If you want the, uh, the quizzes and the downloads from this webinar directly, I'll include a link to that um, in the description of this video so you can go download those and we'll send them right over to you. Um, so I, I hope this was great food for thought for you and thank you so much for your time.